The Law Show on CL 650. A comprehensive look at everything you need to know about the law. <laughs> Is that what you play in the office? <laughs> hey, and welcome to The Law Show. My name is Zach Spencer, and uh, you're listening to CL650. Today, we're focusing on school trips, and with us in studio is Joe Murphy, QC lawyer and partner at Murphy Batista in Vancouver, along with him, uh, Jeffrey Neuenberg, also from Murphy Batista. So, Joe, why don't you introduce Jeffrey and tell me what he does? Uh, Zach, Jeffrey joined, or we call him Jeff, joined the firm a few years ago. He actually went through law school with my middle son. Oh, yeah. Uh, they both came and joined the firm after they graduated. You got better marks, Jeff. Ah, <laughs> good question. We'll leave that one alone. <laughs> good question. So they, they both joined the firm. When you're a lawyer and you graduate from law school, you've got to apprentice for a year, which mm-hmm. is an excellent way to learn the business. Um, it's called Articlean, and both of them articled for a year. That's mostly working in an office, but 10 weeks of that year is in a classroom. Um, They were both what's called called to the bar, which means they become a real lawyer. And uh, that was, I'm guessing, about three years ago? Yeah, it was back in uh, 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 2013. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Jeff is one of the lawyers at the firm. We have 17 lawyers in the firm. There's three partners, and there's a group of senior associate lawyers and junior associate lawyers. Um, We have two offices, one in downtown Vancouver, which is where we've been since we set up in 1982. And we have an office in Kelowna that opened December 2014. So uh, Jeff is one of those junior lawyers who does some of his own cases and works with the senior lawyers on bigger cases. So uh, we, we've all seen uh, or read the books about lawyers, the firm and what have you. Is it as grueling as, uh, as you see uh, written or, or, or in, the, in the films with the junior lawyers uh, uh, working I'm, 80 hours a week? I haven't had to shoot anybody yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can hire a lawyer once yeah. you uh, do, uh, j- all joking aside. Yeah. Um, so today we want to talk about school trips. And this is something we're talking really to parents and grandparents here today. Obviously, children aren't listening uh, about school trips. And when the school trip form comes home, and uh, the kid wants to go. They're very excited. There's a school trip to Playland or they're going to the aquarium or they're doing something more adventurous, going hiking or skiing. Um, We want to talk about the uh, liabilities there and what you have to ask when you're child wants to go on a school trip i get these forms in and the kids all want to go on the trip and you just sign it and send the 10 or 15 dollars in whatever it costs to cover it and uh hope they have a good time and uh and and a lot of times it's a good time there's not a lot of educational purposes for some of these trips especially towards the end of the year so what's your advice to the parents and the grandparents that are listening now if you are the guardian of a child and they want to go on a school trip well zach my advice is based upon cases that i've done I've done three uh, cases that, uh, where the claims arose from school trips. Uh, two of them were young kids, that 16, 17, who suffered spinal cord injuries and were left disabled. Uh, one a quadriplegic, one a paraplegic. And another one in which a 17-year-old boy died in the course of a school trip. So I'm really sort of aware of the risks that go with these trips. And generally, uh, the question that I ask myself, and the question that all the schools have in their, in their procedures binder, is, is there an educational benefit that is greater than the risks we're putting these kids to by going on a trip? Um, my experience tells me that if you take kids near water, the risks go way up. Mm-hmm. If you take kids into the outdoors, the risks go up. Uh, a trip to the planetarium or a trip to Science World uh, has far uh, less risk for the kids than a trip, a ski trip to Whistler, a ski mm-hmm. day in Whistler. And um, one of my clients was grade 12. He went on a ski trip to Whistler and ended up breaking his neck in the terrain park and was left quadriplegic. Now, what, that's, a, that's a delicate balance because he could have gone with his parents on the weekend and also done the same thing, but because it's a school event, how does that change everything? Because he would still be taking part in risky behavior, so what, what is the onus now on the teacher and the school and the people watching over them versus just going on the weekend with their parents? Yeah, there, there is a difference between parents who uh, consent to a school as part of this kid's education, 
taking them up to Whistler. Um, and a parent saying to a kid, sure, if you, you've got some friends going to Whistler for the day, go up and have a good time. There is a difference. And uh, as a parent or a grandparent, you expect that there's an educational purpose here. These kids are missing a day of school. So, and that educational purpose must be designed in such a way that the risks are minimal. You can never avoid risks. Bad things can happen, but you can minimize the risks. And on a school trip, I think it's it's essential that the parents understand enough about a trip to know what the risks are. Um, in the case of that uh, young fellow I mentioned who broke his neck in Whistler, his parents had no idea what these kids were um, allowed to do and encouraged to do as part of the trip. Mm -hmm. um, they were in the train park, which is a, High -risk a location area. of a lot of injuries. And he, this boy, uh, was a novice uh, snowboarder, but the instructions he'd been given is you can't ski or snowboard on your own. You've got to stick with the group. And the group he was with was in the snowboard park. Now, what kind of uh, okay, how do you come into the picture here, and what do you do on behalf of the parents, and how did you resolve that case? Do you do you go after the school? Do you, uh, how how does it work? Uh, this, if there's an injury, it's generally the uh, fault of the school. Uh, individual teachers are liable, but like an employee in a business, they're covered by the school insurance, and the school is insured through the government. They have an unlimited insurance um, uh, coverage. Uh, the parents came to me, and in this case, if the kid comes home with a broken arm or snowboarding broken wrist, very common, mm -hmm. parents aren't going to do anything. They, they're they going to say to the kid, you got to be more careful, and he's got a cast on for a few weeks, and then he's recovered. Um, when you have someone badly hurt with lifelong problems, it's very different. And in that case, the parents came to me and we looked at it. Uh, that case actually went to trial about 10 years ago. The jury that heard the case found the kid, my client, 10% at fault. They found the school 10% at fault. And they found Whistler Mountain 80% at fault. But don't you, when That's you get they that, divvied it up. that lift ticket, it has the disclaimer on the back that says you, we're not liable for anything that happens to you while you're on our mountain? Oh, yes, yes. And, and in this case, there was a consent and release signed by the parents for this kid to go on the trip. The reality is a person under the age of 19 in BC doesn't have the legal authority, nor does a parent for him or her, to give up any of his rights. So Whistler has that on the lift ticket. It's on part of the um, a, a yearly pass, but it's uh, it doesn't bind or limit a person under the age of 19 because no one, not them and not their parents, has the right to give up any of their rights. So a quick um, piece of legal advice for anybody over 19, if you go skiing at Whistler and uh, you haven't signed anything that's written on the back of the ticket, is that legally binding? If you haven't signed anything and you haven't being made aware of it when you purchase the ticket. It might be on the ticket. Yeah, there, there are, there's two kinds of cases that flow from that. And the uh, most common one is you buy the day ticket or you go to 7-Eleven and buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. uh, the courts have found that if you're not familiar with Whistler Mountain, if you're a tourist, um, that you're probably not bound by the release because you just weren't familiar with it. Whereas if you're someone who lives in BC who knows that there's the release on the back of the ticket, you buy these tickets all the time, then you probably are bound. And if you have an annual pass, the long contract you sign online, and most people just scroll through it, and hit agree, um, yeah. is probably going to preclude you from recovery. What's, what's interesting, Zach, about those releases is when you actually read them, it's, it's very frightening because it, it, what it says in dealing with a mountain is it says we can be as reckless and negligent as we want and you're still out of luck like the the, the situation that happened there where the the chairlift let loose and one tumbled into the next and a bunch of people fell off i think one person was killed so that's just that's just the way it is well in that case and that was some years ago there was a, a legislation in bc believe it or not called the railway act okay which said uh, when you're transporting someone on rails, and in this case it applied to a gondola, uh, you can't ask them to release their, their rights to sue. Hmm. 
So in that case, there was the right to sue. There was a big question, how did this happen? But the release that most places like Whistler Mountain and any kind of recreational um, company is going to ask you to sign really say you can be as negligent and reckless as you want, and we're still letting you go. And I, I think it's equivalent to me getting into a taxi and saying to the taxi driver, can you take me to the airport, please? And him saying, you've got to sign this first. And mm-hmm. it says, I, the taxi driver, can drive as recklessly and negligently as I want, and you're giving up your rights. Well, I would never sign that. Well, how come this is allowed to uh, exist? Um, it's allowed to exist because people choose to agree to it. But the children, anyone under the age of 19, doesn't have the legal right to agree. Interesting. Well, um, we're talking about uh, children going on uh, school trips. Um, if, the, if there's a risk to the student, if anything should happen to them, um, as you just heard um, Joe Murphy from uh, Murphy Batista mentioning that uh, you can't sign away the rights of your child when you're agreeing for them to go on the school trip. So when we come back, we're going to find out what you should do when that form comes in from the school and they're requesting you to sign the form to let the child go on on the school trip and what you should be asking the school and the teacher and any other parents that are going. You're listening to The Law Show on CL650. Today we are talking about school trips. Joe Murphy is with me. Uh, Jeff Neuenberg, we'll we'll call you Jeff from now on, uh, from Murphy Batista in downtown Vancouver, and we'll pick up this conversation next on CL650. There's more of the show still ahead. This is The Law Show on CL650. Okay.